in his name. Amen. So what would it take you to really reject Jesus? You say nothing. I know that's the church answer. But what if it was just a business deal that involved a lot of money? It was illegal and you probably had a good chance of not being caught. And, or somebody offered you a couple million bucks. Or, or let's take it down from there. The idols of your soul, which are my, like mine, that are things we really want. When, what we think about in our idol moments, idol and idol, different words. Our idol moments is really what we worship. This is what our, consumes us. What if we could have that? We just put off Jesus. We don't need to deny him. We'll just put him off five, ten years. This is what I really want in my life. What does it really cost me to follow Jesus? Now, that's a fair question. Now, again, as we hear the scripture this morning, I want you to understand that Jesus takes this very seriously, and the stakes are very high. So let's stand for the word of God and let him speak to you directly. Luke 12, 8 to 12 and I tell you that everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The word of the Lord. All right, please be seated. I'm using the word ultimate at the beginning of uh, every point, every principle this morning just because I like the word. And, uh, but the, the, the principle, the acrostic, is easy to remember in terms of our conversation with God. It's IRA, okay? The ultimate identification with Christ, the ultimate rejection, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and the ultimate assurance. I'll give you words to say, I'll be with you to the very end, and I will indwell you, and I will never leave you, okay? So now we, we begin with this whole theme of identifying with Christ, and as American Christians, this puts us in kind of an unusual conversation, because most Americans in a pluralistic society would say it's no big deal. But remember, there are various levels of being ashamed of Jesus and of denying Jesus. We realize now that most believers in the world are under tremendous fire. But listen again to the word of God here in this very first principle. If whoever acknowledges me before men... In other words, there's a boldness. There's a one to say, I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on board. I belong to him. The Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Wow. That is really hard stuff. And I said this morning, I, I, I said to the first service, I said, let's not make this a nice sermon, please. And I said, the sermon will get more annoying as we go along. And hopefully hard hitting. That's just a hard text. You know, if I blow it, he's going to deny me before the angels of God? So let's step back and think about identity for a second. What we identify with. Now, the obvious thing in this town is when we wear the color orange, we are identifying with the Marcos. And there's certain pride to that, you know. It's the pride of the city. There's a few exceptions in this room who wear different colors, and we love them because of Jesus. And... Uh, and all that stuff, but there's, what, what, what's the big deal? Why would I, what, I mean, identify with them, and they win, what happens? I kind of win, too. You know, they're my boys. They're my pride and joy, and, you know, it's, it's funny. It's all over the world, and it's really true if you look, not just at, um, at Europe with the soccer fervor there. I mean, you go anywhere around the world, and you see this incredible identification with teams, it's in Asia, too. Matter of fact, when I, when I uh, was in China, it was a, a year, year and a half ago now, to see the number of young people that have grown up on Kobe Bryant. Now, he's not playing anymore in Laker jerseys in China. And uh, their fascination with identifying with U.S. athletes. They, wanna, they want that in their life. They want that meaning, the significance, the abilities. They want to be special like that. And so... 
And it's a very important part of what we're drawn to. We identify with certain bands. And by the way, if you talk to people about musical interest, there'd be such a variety even in this room, just trying to make sense of the music that moves our hearts. But again, it's because we see life. We see something that attracts us. And uh, but when it comes to Jesus Christ, it's a little more difficult. And, and the reason why, the Bible says that there's a whole world system, like a powerful stream, that is going against the kingdom of God and the person of Christ. And that seems, ugh, ugh, what do you mean? So much so that when the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 speaks about our growth in Christ, he says what? Some of you know this verse. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because there's a different identity here. Now, remember where we're going in Luke 12. And there's a beautiful, as you study the Bible, some of you are brand new to the Bible. Jesus was saying last week that do not fear those that can only kill the body. We said, well, I'm going to be afraid. That's my whole life. He said, that all they can do is kill your body. And what are they going to do after that? Remember? Then he turned around. He took it further. And he says, fear the one who not only can kill the body, but what? He, Jesus said, send your soul into hell forever. The authority of the eternal God over our immortal soul. And, and so Jesus was saying that to help them understand the challenges of life. And what is it going to mean to be a faithful Christian in the world? And now with that in mind, he's, he's really laying it out here that if you're not willing to acknowledge me, then I'm not going to do that at the heavenly court in heaven. Now, you're going to be, we're going to take you through this here so you don't start wondering, well, I guess he doesn't love me. I've had a bad week. None of that stuff. None of the, but what this is, is a picture of the end times court of the universe. And now it's a big word. Like if when Brian goes to seminary, he's going to learn big words and a lot of fancy phrases just so he can say he went to seminary. And one of them is this. It's the eschatological future has become present. The what? Eschatology is the doctrine of the end times. And I'm going to break it down by, by turning it around and saying, what happens when you become a Christian? Well, the Spirit of God comes to indwell you, but what else happens? The life of eternity of heaven begins in you. Let's break it down even more. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. It is a quality of life. It's the life of eternity when you open your life up to the life of God. Eternity has begun. Heaven begins in your soul. Yes, it's a mortal body, an earthly tent. It's going to the grave. But the very life that you're going to inhabit for all of eternity has begun in you. Eternity begins now because of the resurrection of Christ and the life of the Spirit. Does everybody follow that? So Jesus is saying the flip side of that, the same judgment that will come one day when the eternal courts gather and what surrounds the presence of God as judge? The angels. The cherubim, the seraphim. You can't miss that. Again, many of you are new to the Bible, but as you see the judgments of God carried out in the book of Revelation in the future, they're carried out by angels. And that's, that's fascinating. So he's taking you before the court and he's saying... When you stand before the court, and what, what's going to happen with us? Well, if you're in Christ, when John the judge sees me, he sees his son. Please, please understand that. He sees his son. Why is that? Not because I'm a good person. Because I'm in Christ. All right? He's taken all my sins. And so my judgment may involve the loss of things that I blew away in this life, a loss of blessing, but it will never, ever involve the holy wrath of God against sin because he's going to continue to see Jesus. And Jesus is my attorney. You understand that? Of course. He's my advocate. He's my covering. I am in him. Does everybody follow that? But if you're not in him, you're going to stand in the courtroom what? without an attorney. And by the way, when people do that in the court system, I say, wow, at least get a public defender. No, I'll defend myself. Ooh. I mean, Really? But this is the eternal God of the universe, and you have nobody to represent you. I didn't want to believe. I didn't care. I didn't, you know. And Jesus is taking it on a personal level, saying, 
if you're not willing to identify yourself as my follower, most likely you're not in Christ. You're naked without me. Now, again, he's not going to nitpick you had a bad week, you blew up at work, you cursed. No, 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 none of that, none of that. He's giving you a picture of what it means to live in Christ and to wear the ring of his kingdom and say, I belong to Jesus. And the Bible is giving us a reminder of one of the coolest disciples, the mouthy disciple who is named what? Who's the mouthy disciple? Peter. Everybody knows that. Peter's a big mouth. He says stuff before he thinks about it. You know anybody does that? Yeah, we all do in some ways. Some people just blurt out. It's never any process. <laughs> Peter would say the dumbest stuff. And of course, he was the first one out of the boat when Jesus was walking there. He's the first one to start drowning. Come, you know, he's always involved in the action. And he said this about denying Jesus. He said, even if everybody else forsakes you, man, I've got the seminary degree. You know, I've been in the right church. I've got the right pastor. I have the right youth group. I'm with you. I'm there. I am there. And uh, so Jesus had a conversation with Peter one day before all this. And he said, listen, Pete, Pete, or Simon, Simon. I don't know if he called him Pete very much. He said, um, Satan, let me tell you the story. He said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. What does that mean, by the way? You know, some of you aren't agricultural, but some of you are. Tear it apart. Find the good wheat, all right? To, he's going to put you through the mill. He's going to have you. He's going to challenge you with a hard temptation. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that you may not what fail. And when you have turned, you're going to make a big mistake. The word for repentance, metanoia, right there. What does he say? Do you remember? Strengthen your brother, because there's a lot of people that are going to blow it just like you that need somebody there for you. And so what was he doing? He was saying, don't boast about this. You're going to need me, and you're going to know that I'm your Lord, but it's going to come through many, many times of failure. And you are going to boldly confess that I'm Jesus. But not before you deny me how many times? And after the what crows? The, the rooster, the cock crows. You'll deny me three times. And by the way, it says after that, and Jesus looked at him. Whew. The look of love. Some tough stuff. So this is all about the ultimate identification. Don't let it push you into a place where you say, I can't be a Christian now. I must have messed up. You will know what it means on every level of your life to confess Jesus or deny him. I deny him not by saying, no, I don't believe in him. That's not what I'm, of course I'm not going to say that. I deny him by living for false gods and false idols and choosing my idols, the things that I think will satisfy me more than God, over the Lord Jesus Christ. I do it, you do it, I just do it more, okay? So that's a way of denying Jesus. Now, because, because I'm like Peter, I, I'm, I'm still going to be sifted like wheat through the challenges of life pulled apart. But when I'm turned, I'm going to help strengthen you and you're going to help strengthen me. All right. That's the first principle. The ultimate identification is with Jesus Christ. Do you belong to him or not? Now, again, in Saudi Arabia, that's much tougher. It's much, much tougher all across the world than it is right here. But it's going to get tougher in America. Please, I know you don't believe that. I know you don't. But it's going to get tougher in America. And I'm talking about not... A, a political part of identifying with Jesus. I'm talking about as a follower of Christ in every way, shape, and form, all right? I are the ultimate rejection. Now, I did take a survey in the first service, and most people raised their hand saying that was the one question they had asked them the most, or at least in the top five. Let's go right after it. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, Peter, all of us, will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. How many of you have ever been asked that? Did I commit the unforgivable sin? No? No one's ever thought about that? Or are you just being shy? 
Let me tell you something. If you're asking this question with real sincerity, it's not you. Because the Holy Spirit is already working in your life. And he's giving two categories of people. What are they? Sinners like us that have been transformed by grace, that do stupid things like Peter, that wind up at different levels of our life denying Jesus. What does he say about us? We will be forgiven. Why? Because we're trying harder? No, because of the grace of God offered in Jesus Christ on the cross that covers everything. So what's the opposite one? What is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? I'd love to see Brian write a paper on that. It'd be fascinating. Use all of Scripture, and there's your assignment. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the deep and persistent rejection of what God has offered in Christ and is offered through the Holy Spirit. It's saying like George Bernard Shaw, I've done my own sinning. I'll do my own saving. Thank you. I do not need the offer of God, of his son, for me, for salvation. And my heart is persistently hardened towards the offer of God of grace and salvation. So the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the rejection of the gospel. Can you hear that? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the rejection of the gospel, which is the greatest news in all the world. You say, what if I do it? You won't because you're already wrestling with it. And you're here and you've received the good news in Jesus Christ. But it's speaking about on a deeper level for believers, not just those who reject Christ. Be careful about your heart commitments. Be careful. Be careful. Don't stay out of the grace of God. There, in in um, Luke 14, there's an incredible passage the parable of the banquet. I don't know if anyone's ever read it. And we're going to move towards that as we move towards Easter. And uh, it was one of the first parables that I studied growing up and in our youth group. And it's about all sorts of people who have been invited to the banquet of God. And what's it about? Excuses. I think it's Luke 14. Is it 14, 14? Or it's in there. Let's see. It's in there, trust me, Luke 14. And uh, one of them says, I got to get married. One of them says, I got work to do on the farm. So we, when we were in youth group a long time ago, we had a song we sang. I bet you Brian's never heard of this song. <clears throat> it's called, I Cannot Come to the Banquet. It's really corny. And it taught me this powerful truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. I cannot come to the banquet, don't bother me now. I have married a wife, I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Please hold me excused, I cannot come. See, you never heard that, have you? See, that shows the ages and the difference. And so our youth group got a hold of it. We sang that back in the day. And so we would sing silly versions of it. Can I come to the banquet? Don't bother me now. I've married a cow. I've bought me a wife. And so we married all But the point was being is you're offered salvation. You're offered salvation. You say, was that song from the 1800s? No, it's about 1895. But um, you're offered the banquet, and you've given every excuse in the world to close your heart to the living God. And you see, that's what it's about. And Hebrews 3 says the same thing. If you hear his voice today, do not harden your hearts as the Old Testament folks did in the rebellion. For those who were, for who were those who heard and rebelled? Was it not those who were left Egypt led by Moses? In other words, the people of God in the Exodus? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years, the people of God? Was it not with those whom, who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness, people of God? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient, people of God? See, so we see that we were, they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now, theological debate, are they in heaven or not? I believe they are because of the covenant people of God. The point is they never, ever got to the place God had for them in their life. They wandered. They never entered that rest. They never got to the fullness of God's plan. Now, we never do completely because of our sin and our belligerence, but they, they kind of fell by the wayside. And I tell you, one of the things that people have said to me is an encouragement, and it's not easy, is finish well, finish well, finish well. Whatever happens in your ministry, whatever discouragements, whatever heartaches you have. Sam Jerfer used to always say that to me. Finish well, finish well, finish well. 
I say to Brian, begin well, begin well, begin well. But, but to finish well, the people in the Old Testament never finished. They never got to the place where God's plan and, and best for them was showing up. They dropped by the wayside. And so this is not a text like, okay, the ultimate, the ultimate rejection is not us, so why would we worry about it? We're already going to be in heaven. We're Jesus's. We're never going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The Bible also warns about carelessly disregarding the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you to obedience and calling you to a change of life and calling me. And don't harden your hearts because it leads to spiritual heart disease. And that's a terrible thing. Thirdly and finally, IRA, the ultimate identification, the ultimate rejection, the ultimate assurance. Luke 11, Luke 12, excuse me, verse 11. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. What is one of the greatest evidences of the resurrection of Christ? It's kind of a side question. You say, well, is this an exam? Sort of. One of them is changed lives, okay? I'm a different man. I was blind, but now I see. But, but let me say externally, one of the greatest evidences for the resurrection and power of Christ is this. The growth of the church worldwide. The kingdom of God, which is now slowly moving into every nation of the world, every ethnic group, started with a bunch of 12 motley losers. Yeah, they're just like us. Fishermen, they weren't educated. And they were boisterous. They, had, they, wanted, to, they wanted to go back to their fishing most of the time. They ran and hid when Jesus was arrested, and the women were the only one to publicly come out and take a stand. They hid behind locked doors. And from that group of 12 disciples, some of whom called themselves the sons of what? Thunder, thank you, Brian. Thunder. They're motorcycle type guys. Right? From that group, which Brian would say very ordinary stuff, they're actually less than ordinary. The book of Acts says those who have changed the world have come hither. Now, I'm, and I say that to my dear secular friends, I say, how in the world would you ever, ever explain the growth of the kingdom of God around the world? You can't. Because the Lord is saying, whenever you have a closed door, I'll open it, or you go to another open door, and I'll give you words, my spirit is within you, and I will be with you. We celebrated this morning 53 years for this church that's been through a lot, it's been through a lot, and why is the Lord still with us? What? Because he said, I will have my hand upon my church until I decide when and where I will go other places. I am the one who upholds my church. So what happens, very briefly? <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus lives <coughs> in us and with us. And every opportunity, <clears throat> spiritually, is an open door. And that open door is provided by Christ. So the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, the promise of the Holy Spirit begins to reveal Christ to you. It's not Brian's preaching or my preaching or if we're really on having a great week. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth of Christ to us, reveals the presence of Christ to us. It is Christ in us. But here's what happens. Not only does the Holy Spirit reveal Christ to us, the Holy Spirit reveals Christ from us. Which means when I say to you, I see Jesus in you and I learn from you, and I see things that you're going through, and I learn and I am strengthened and encouraged from that, and there's nothing more powerful than a conversation of believers that literally leads to a life change because the Christ in you is speaking to the Christ in me. So when Jesus says, if you're wondering how you're going to get through this hard situation, and the whole history of the gospel has been hostile nations and hostile workplaces, the Lord says, I'll give you an open door and I'll give you, I'll show you and give you the words to say at that time. 
I will advance my kingdom. I will do my thing. You're just along for the ride. Now, some of the theological traditions have, um, and this is something that's not the Reformed tradition, basically said that when we give sermons, we don't need to prepare anything. It's the moment. It's just catch the moment. One pastor would say, you'd look out and see your eyes and say, ah, let's see what God is saying this morning. That's not what the text is saying. In other words, I can play golf all week and just walk in here and speak to you. Nope, that's not the way it works. Do you hear that, Brian? And he knows that. It's laboring in the word all week long and preparing what God has for both of us. So it's not saying be sloppy and lazy, but saying there's a person in your life right now, you don't know what to say to them, and you don't know if you should say anything right away. And there's someone else, there's a situation at work, and the Lord says, I will go before you. And because I live in you and I indwell you, I will reveal myself through you and I'll give you the words to say. And sometimes, it may be with a friend, you said that you didn't even know what you were saying and you changed their life in a very powerful way. You said one word, or it was a timely word, it was a word in season, and it was a word with, filled with love, and it was a word of the power of God. So here's how I apply this sermon. Lord, I'm not going to deny you, particularly I got all the theological words down pretty well. I had to, to become a Presbyterian pastor. But so many times, Lord, I trust in my idols, and I run to those idols, those things that are secondary, gifts from you that are not you, and I trust in them and want them more than I want you. And so, Lord, take my idols and cleanse me from them and allow me to confess Jesus Christ without hesitation, that he's my everything, he's my all. And if I have the audacity to sing hymns like I Surrender All, help me to understand that I'm singing from the depth of my heart with the reality that you truly are God. The only confession that matters is this. And Peter gave it. Do you remember? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this confession, I will build my church worldwide and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the study in Luke 12 and to continue to understand as Christ heads towards Jerusalem your call upon our lives. And Father, it's so easy just to be, well, just be ashamed of the gospel. And in certain situations, it's not in church. We've got our church smiles on right now. But when we're faced with difficult situations, and Father, we know that you're not going to let us go. You can't let us go because we're in Christ. But if there's anyone here who's never received Jesus Christ, and they don't understand that organic unity with Jesus of having the Spirit of God live in their soul, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus Christ, I sense you're drawing me to yourself. I want you. I want your life in me. I want your love to fill my heart. I invite you to be my Lord and Savior, and I give my sins to you, and in return you give me the perfected righteousness of Jesus. I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean, and I am filled with your Spirit. If you prayed that prayer, you've entered the kingdom of heaven. And Father, for those of us who name your name, this is such an easy text to blow off. Wow, we never would deny you. And yet we're constantly clinging to false idols. So give us, Father, the boldness to trust you. And we confess again, like Thomas, my Lord and my God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please stand for our final song. Mm -hmm.